Good afternoon. Welcome to my channel. Um, I have another extract from my new book, which is called Run for the Hell of It. 50 running adventures from 5k to 100 miles. So this is out now on Amazon. It's, uh, yeah, as its name suggests, it is a compendium of tales of the crazy running exploits I got up to in lockdown. And um, I thought I would read you another chapter. Um, just going to give you two um, I've already had a couple of early extracts much further back in the in the channel, but this is going to be the fourth and final excerpt that I read. Um, if you want to know more, you'll have to read the book. Um, yes, so this is from run number 27, and it is the story of my running up and down Ben Nevis, which is Britain's tallest mountain. So here we go, Ben Nevis. What on earth am I doing? Just three days after my less than stellar run along the Forth and Clyde Canal, here I am in a small car park beside the towering monster that is the UK's highest mountain. Running up Ben Nevis seemed like a good idea a week or so ago when I decided to realise an old ambition. I'd long heard that there was a Ben Nevis fell race, and that meant, presumably, that there were some hardy and insanely fit souls who actually attempted to run this beast, all 4,413 feet of it. I didn't want to join their race, which in any case had been postponed until September 2022, but I do want to know what it feels like to attack and conquer this behemoth. It's, it's no Mount Everest. In fact, you could stack more than six Nevises into one Sagamata, as it's called by the Nepalese. Still, Nevis remains Scotland's biggest mountain, albeit not one of its toughest. I feel it might just be possible to run up it, since I have a hazy memory from my undergraduate days of coming down a gently stepped tourist path the only other time I climbed this mountain. In my prior excursion somewhere around 1991, I'd visited Nevis with my then housemate Neil and two of his buddies, and we decided the manicured curated path was just too easy. Instead, we scaled the neighbouring Munro, Cairn Mor Darg, the ninth highest peak in Scotland at 4,012 feet and crept along the arete between it and its towering neighbour. I still have a pristine memory of waterfalls of white cloud pouring over the rock ridge as we surveyed our route. The moisture made the rocks on the arete slippery. A climber fell to his death here in 2015. And my flatmate stopped to relieve himself off the ridge, his sunlit arc of wee vanishing into the billowing white clouds which had dropped below us. Thirty years ago, that was a magical way to ascend Nevis. Today, I decide to stick to the safer route and just see how things progress. I announce my intentions on social media with a photo of the sign in the car park which denotes access to Ben Nevis. Now there's no possibility of wimping out. My legs feel reasonably rested from the almost marathons of earlier in the week and I'm fairly confident I can run at least 60% of it, my arbitrary minimum requirement for calling something a run. I change surreptitiously in Roxy and don my backpack I'm taking no chances today and have brought a spare t-shirt and a jacket which I'll probably keep tied around my waist for most of the ascent. I'm wearing leggings because even though it's a lovely intermittently sunny day when I set off, I know it will be a quite different climate at the top. The path heads off at a gentle enough incline, hard packed red dirt interspersed with the occasional boulder step. These have clearly been placed here, indeed. For the first 75% of the route, it's evident this path has been built with the aim of making Britain's biggest hillock accessible to thousands. It's been estimated that around 150,000 people climb it annually. The pandemic has evidently helped thin out the crowds, hence the car park space I located with ease, and the fact that it's a good five minutes before I start catching up with people, almost all in groups or pairs, making their way down or up the mountain. At the lower slopes, the contour lines aren't very close together, and the slope is gentle enough to allow me to get up a decent pace and still leap the boulders where possible. Indeed, it's not until about 20 minutes in that I have to reduce my pace. Even then, it's because I've caught up with a party of about a dozen hikers and have to wait until they realise I'm behind them, expecting to overtake. Everyone I pass steps aside with good graces and I make sure I say thanks and try not to trip over anyone's foot. In only one or two cases do I suspect a note of irritation that some lycra townie is stupidly trying to run up a mountain. I'm probably overdoing it on this easy section, given that online guides have suggested allowing three to four hours for the climb and two to three for the descent. 
I vowed to take considerably less than seven hours for this adventure. I've set off at 10.11am and I want to be back down by 1pm or 2pm if possible. I'm only running or stomping at a little under 14 minutes per mile, but there's a considerable way to go. The path at the start is so gentle that it feels like it will take forever to gain any sort of height. But soon the caravan site below me in the valley of Glen Nevis looks like a collection of discarded Lego bricks. I'm tempted to take many photos, then vow to be sparing and fail. The view just keeps getting better and better, and at the lower slopes at least, the path is often sheltered by shimmering silver birch and other young saplings. Every few hundred yards, an icy crystal clear burn trickles or gushes through rocky crevices, seeking respite from its own gravity. It's a perfectly ambient temperature and greying up overhead, but without the promise of rain, none has been forecast. Actually, there's just one tiny patch of rain in front of the distant hills, an oddly slanting column of precipitation such as I've never seen before. Any poor people in the path of that micro-shower are decidedly unlucky, since all around is fair, misty mid-morning. A few dopey sheep ignore my presence as much as sheep ever can, getting skittish only when I come too close. For the most part, there are no living things on this mountain, bar brightly liveried hikers and the occasional butterfly. Soon the latter will have vanished too, as meadow gives way to scrubby grassland at about a thousand metres. Once above the tree line, the path turns to a more challenging set of steep rocky steps, and I have to clear my throat or give a timid, excuse me, to the climbing parties I pass. In general, I can't really cope with being behind people, a tendency which stands me in good stead in races, but is less helpful here, because it means I have to keep my pace up to pass people promptly and politely. I also have to make my photo stops rather cursory, since I don't want the awkwardness of leapfrogging the same people all the way up the hillside. This proves a challenge. There's a photogenic angle everywhere I look. Above me, the mountain literally vanishes into the clouds, adding drama to the inherent madness of running uphill. Rounding one steep, rocky corner, the ground levels out briefly, and a small tarn, colloquially called the Halfway Lochen, appears. It's a misnomer since I'm now at 1,870 feet, with almost 2,300 to go. The path doesn't skirt the Lochen, but instead veers off to the south. And it's here that another runner passes me. He's belting downhill, and his face is set in a rictus grin of determination that doesn't allow for more than a curt nod of acknowledgement. I find myself speeding up, and it's relatively easy to achieve a 15-minute mile pace. Not exactly stellar, but a big improvement on the incremental clambering of 500 feet further on, where steeply stepped switchbacks reduce me to a stomp. I still pass everyone, but I'm no longer sure if you can technically call this running. It's a sort of hopping climb, just fast enough to make groups edge towards the side of the pathway to let me pass. Cloud is pouring down into the valley below, framing a distant Loch Linney with candy floss wisps. I must surely have reached the halfway point. I'm half expecting a signpost to that effect, but it doesn't come. Instead, I only begin to realise that I'm on the final stretch, when neatly stacked boulders give way to shattered granite spurs, broken apart by freezing and thawing. The temperature noticeably drops and vegetation all but vanishes at the 3,000 feet mark. There is moss and lichen in evidence, but not much else dares to cling to these permanently wet rocks. I pass teams of increasingly serious looking hiking parties, many of them with poles and heavyweight cagoules. I must look absurd hopping by in shorts. I console myself with the knowledge that proper fell runners are always depicted in singlets and tiny 70s style shorts. Soon photos become impossible since there's nothing to see but banks of fog-like cloud with anorak walkers stumbling out of it now and again. I have to divide my attention between not plunging onto the sodden sharp rocks and not barging into mountaineers. Somehow I'm still running, amazed that my knees, calves and quads are all holding up so far. My breathing is pretty even and my heart rate is surprisingly steady too. Sure, from time to time I have to push my hands down onto my thighs to propel me up a steep bit but the plentiful switchbacks are providing a surprising number of runnable stretches, and by now I must have overtaken at least a hundred climbers. One lone hiker comments, You're the only person to pass me all day. Well done. I thank him and press on. The mountain begins to round off, but I know this is an illusion. Scottish mountains seem to delight in doing this, concealing their real summits beyond a rank of lesser ones. I won't be content until I reach something signifying the actual geographical peak of Ben Nevis. I can't even see the Carn Mor der Garret, wherever it is, and I'm surprised to stumble upon a cairn where some maniacs have positioned nowhere near the summit, 
Don't these people know the rules of cairn making? Behind it, there's a whitely reflective stripe, which I mistake for a bank of backlit cloud, then recognise as snow. Snow in July. A couple of hikers in proper boots and walking poles ascend in front of me, and I wait until they're at the top, in case a stumble sends one of them slithering down into me. My running shoes aren't meant for snow, but fortunately there are steps dug into the half-frozen, half-slushy ice, which I clamber up using my hands when my feet fail to maintain purchase. By the time I get to the top of the snowy patch, my hands are icy, and I blow on them for warmth, as I follow an indistinct path through a boulder-strewn wilderness of rock. No non-human living thing comes here, I'll warrant, except perhaps an especially intrepid bird of prey. I lose the path briefly and almost stumble over the semicircular lip of a cliff edge fringed in snow. I think the arete lies beyond it, but it's impossible to tell. That route could easily have proven lethal today. As well as the cloud I'm stumbling through, it's drizzling dismally, and there's a strong and constant wind. I'll have to find the summit soon, and can't tarry, not with the flimsy layers I'm wearing. Another five minutes later, I make out what seems to resemble a tumble-down cottage. Someone has built an ill-fated structure here. Presumably a bothy of some sort. Beside the ruin, there's a concrete encircled protuberance with a tiny metal shack on top of it. Adjacent to that is a trig point, also built up for better visibility. It's unoccupied, so I declare at the summit and climb up to take photos. Shades and ghosts echo and drift all around me. Some of these walkers and climbers could easily be otherworldly, and it would be difficult to tell them apart from the flesh and blood visitors. In all this smur, reality itself begins to fade. It will fade fully and finally if I let hypothermia set in, so after a brief inspection of the tiny metal shelter, whose door is plastered in stickers and decals, I decide to take my leave. That tin box could be a lifesaver when the weather gets impossibly bad, and there are sufficient snack wrappers inside to suggest it's been salvation for more than a few climbers. However, it also resembles a steel coffin, and I'm not tempted to climb inside. Another intimation of mortality appears as I make to leave. A square column of rock contains a couple of lichen-splattered plaques. Britain's highest memorial, it reads. Apparently erected to the glory of God and in remembrance of the fallen of all races on VJ Day, August 15th, 1945, the plaque is a sobering reminder of how quickly life can be snuffed out. I take its photo and depart. The run down Ben Nevis is just as demanding as the ascent, and I doubt I'll be much faster going down than scrambling up. For one thing, my quads are on fire and my knees are protesting. Secondly, the mist has spread and coated the rocks and boulders with a sheen of moisture which challenges my footwear. Amusingly, it's just as I'm composing a thank you note to Brooks in my head for the superior performance of their shoes that I begin to fall on my arse. At one point, having just goat-stepped past one climber, I slip and do a sort of crab-like half-cartwheel into a streamlet 20 yards or so above a young southeastern Asian climber. My behind takes the brunt, and like a typical male, I wave off inquiries as to my well-being and make some sort of dumb remark about it being a bit challenging. Still, despite the frequent missteps, I don't fall seriously, and the path dries out at the lower contours. I even manage a decent dash on the level bit near the Lochan, now fully understanding the other runner's grimace. The descent is tough, harder than the climb, which was surprisingly manageable. My quads feel like they've been used as punching bags. One hour and ten minutes after I leave the summit, I'm louping down the gravel pass towards the car park, where I collapse against the information board and stop Strava on my phone. It has taken me one hour and twenty-two to ascend and one hour and ten to get back down which surprises me since part two seemed much faster. I'm really happy with my performance, feeling especially vindicated after the canal debacle of a few days previously. I'd read that a pro climber might manage the ascent and descent in three or three and a half hours, and I've cut almost 40 minutes from that. What a mountain and what a run. There are more demanding and remote peaks in Scotland, but none higher. I'll probably pay for it in a day or two when delayed onset muscle soreness takes over. But for now, I'm ready to go and find several thousand calories, curate the best photos and announce to the world that I just ran up Ben Nevis. Yes, so that that run was 10 miles altogether. Um, which is a lot. It does seem like a lot, but I guess there were a lot of switchbacks. 
and 2 hours 32 altogether uh, at an average of just 3.6 miles an hour which is not that surprising considering I'm running up a mountain and I gave that a 6 out of 10 because it was surprisingly pleasant anyway that is a chapter from Run For The Hell Of It which is on Amazon now go and get yourself a copy um, it's also available on uh, Kindle uh, as well as paperback and yeah really what this book is about is rediscovering the joy of running in Britain and giving yourself running challenges rather than just continually running around the same routes so if you like uh, inspiration for your running or exercise or you just want to have a little travelogue of different parts of Britain and what it's like to run in them then this book is for you and I will see you again with a short story very soon. Bye for now.